We're in the middle of a revolution. Um, I'm not sure you really realize it. You don't know it sometimes until after it's over. But uh, when I saw my pediatrician back in the 1960s, he was making conclusions about how sick I was and what sickness I had and things based on very, very limited information. He'd look down my throat, he'd look in my ear, he'd take my temperature, but he was making a decision based on very limited data. In the last 50 years, what has happened is we have gone from trying to make inferences from fairly limited data to being swamped with data, swamped with data. And what I'm going to talk to you about is what that data is and what the importance of it is. But we're now trying to find the signal and the noise. We're not trying to find um, the important piece of information. We, that's what we're trying to find. We're not trying to just simply deduce from a very limited amount of information what's going on. I want you to meet my grandson, who was born a couple of weeks ago in the Packard Children's Hospital right down the street here. Theo is... Um, a wonderful child. He is the most important thing in my, way, in my life at this point. Um, his mother is a triathlete. She ran until she was eight months pregnant. So she used to tell me, in fact, that she ran during the day and he ran at night and kept her up. <laughs> okay? Um, Theo is informationally unique. In history, roughly 100 billion Homo sapiens have lived on this planet, walked this planet. And he is informationally unique. Now, I'm going to explain to you why, but this is where medicine is going. What makes us different? What makes this person in front of me different from me? I'm approximately 190 pounds of meat and bones. He's probably approximately 190 pounds of meat and bones. When you kind of zoom in on us, we both look kind of the same. It's when you only get down to the informational content in our bodies that you start finding out what's different about us. There are approximately 100 trillion cells in my body. That's a very big number. And each one of them contains a nucleus that contains 6 billion base pairs. That that's the DNA inside my body, the genome inside my body. I'm approximately 0.1% different than that gentleman sitting in front of me here. Every human being is approximately 0.1% different. That sounds like a small number, 0.1%, but 0.1% of 6 billion base pairs is 6 million differences. So we're talking big numbers here. Prepare yourself, because the numbers are going to get bigger. Oops, I hit the wrong button. There we go. We also have an epigenome that lays on top of our genome. It's methylation patterns that turn up or down, turn off or on the genetic instructions, the code that's in each one of my cells. The epigenome, it's hard to measure. We don't know much about it yet, but we do know that it does affect disease. We do know, for example, that PTSD is an epigenomic disease. It's... it's the methylation patterns are caused by the stresses we, appear, we encounter during life, the various things that have happened to us during our life. Then inside my body, there's a microbiome. These are the bacteria, the microbes that are floating around inside my gut or in my lungs or in my throat or on my skin. There are approximately one quadrillion microbes in my body one quadrillion, 10 times as many cells that my body consists of. Frankly, it's probably more accurate to describe us as cruise ships. Okay, I'm basically carrying around an awful lot of passengers. There are microbes living in my body. They all, by the way, have genomes. They all have nucleuses. There are all kinds of information floating around my body that isn't even me. Most of the time, I need it to help me digest food. But in some cases, it can cause an infection. It can be something bad, like methicillin-resistant Staph aureus or something. So that is an important parcel of information in trying to understand my health. Then I have an immune system that's floating around my body. I've talked to an immunologist who told me he thinks that I have between one and five billion distinct 
immune cells in my body. These are the cells that contain the memories of the illnesses that I've had in the past or the invaders that I've fought off. They, contain, they are cells that can kill if they see another one of those invaders. So my immune system is also important to my health. Autoimmune diseases are all effectively out of control immune systems that are targeting various things. The information in my immune system is important. Then there's a virome. I have, I don't know how many, billions of viruses floating around in my body, little snippets of viral code just trying to replicate themselves. I have a communicome. That's the parts of my body that are communicating with other parts of my body. Insulin is a communicator, for example. And then I have a proteome. These are the proteins made by the various genomes in my body. You can see we're dealing with huge numbers. And yet, each one of these categories that I've just described to you is at the core of important diseases in, in humanity. This is the context in which medicine is now existing, coming to. It's an important context to understand because while we talk about how we're trying to improve our care of patients, the world, the scientific world, is changing and giving us more and more information about our bodies. To make it even more complicated, my body grows. I get more cells as I go. Theo probably doesn't have 100 trillion. He probably only has 10 trillion, but he's growing. He's changing. My epigenome is changing slowly as I'm facing stress, for example, if I was stationed in Afghanistan or something of that sort. My microbiome is changing daily. If I ate at a Thai restaurant, it's changing very differently than if I ate at a French restaurant. Immune cells are changing daily as I'm exposed to various things that cause that change. So in other words, they could check my immune system and then four days later, my immune system could be slightly different. In an autoimmune disease, it's definitely different. The virome, the communicome, the proteome, they're all changing daily. So all these huge data sets that I'm talking about that are important to healthcare are also not standing still. They're changing. <laughs> Medicine is becoming the ultimate big data problem. Doctors are going to need help. They can't keep it all in their head. You can't keep millions and quadrillions of pieces of information in your head. I'm a venture capitalist. I invest in startups that affect medical decision making. Okay, so this is something that I have focused on, focused my investment career on at Claremont Creek Ventures. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the companies very quickly that we've invested in that are doing specifically this. The first one is Natera, that does reproductive genetics. They basically do a prenatal test. My daughter-in-law had her blood drawn at nine weeks of pregnancy, and they knew everything about Theo. Theo was born into this world with a medical record, an electronic health record that contained billions of data points, and he hadn't even been born yet because his genome was inferred from his mother's blood when she was nine weeks pregnant. This is the future of medicine, where a child is brought into this world and they already know if he is going to respond to codeine or respond to various uh, antibiotics or drugs. Another investment that we made was Assurex. This is a company that takes a cheek swab of a patient who has just seen a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a pain management specialist, and they can tell the doctor definitively using genes that are available inside that saliva sample, whether you will respond to Celexa or Prozac or not. If you're familiar at all with depression, they give you a drug and then they see if you feel better in six weeks, and if not, they give you a different one. This is a, drug, a, a, a process that in fact tells them what drug will work and what the dose is that should work best for that patient. Prime Genomics and Natera are also working on cancer. Prime Genomics is using a saliva sample to detect breast cancer before it's visible on a mammogram. They can see expression factors and genetic profiles in your saliva, which comes from lymph, that tell them there's a mutation that's happened. There are cells reproducing in the breast that are cancerous. And they can see it before it's even big enough to be visible on a mammogram. So visualize a world where you go in for an annual physical and give a saliva sample, 
and they can tell you, go get a mammogram, we need to find out where it is. Find the disease. Early detection of cancer is fundamental. Natera is looking at how the cancer is changing in response to treatment. If you think about Natera with the, with the uh, reproductive genomics, what they're doing is seeing a very weak fetal signal against a very strong maternal background. Well, that's the problem in cancer, seeing a very weak cancerous signal against a very strong normal background. So Natera is also now moving into cancer as well. I have an investment in a company called Gigagen that profiles the immune system and can see flares before they are actually apparent. If in an MS patient, for example, or, or something of that sort, you will see actually the immune system reacting before the patient actually feels symptoms. So you can minimize the treatment. The treatments are sometimes bad in some of these cases. They give them steroids. If you can reduce that treatment and knock it down before you know about it, it's great. I have an investment in a company called Numedi. By the way, I should tell you, most of these companies are coming out of Stanford, so this is a place I hang around a lot. Um, Numedi is by uh, Professor Atul Butte in, um, in, the, in the medical school. Numedi is doing digital pharmacology. Instead of killing thousands of rats at a big pharma company, what he's done is he's made database search tools that look at the pathways that are involved in diseases and look at the drugs and what pathways they affect. For example, he discovered an antidepressant that had failed in the marketplace back in the 1960s. If you're diagnosed with small cell lung cancer, you're often diagnosed as being depressed as well when you're told that. So they, this antidepressant was prescribed to some of those people. No one noticed at the time, but patients who got that drug for depression went into remission, all of them. This is a drug that can potentially cure small cell lung cancer. And it was available in a database. No one ever just correlated it at all. Finally, I'm taking the concept of code somewhat broadly. A's, T's, C's, and G's are almost exactly the same as zeros and ones in binary code. Our genome is code. It actually is creating programs. It is modulating use. It is doing all kinds of things like that. So I can interpret that as being code as well. I'm a computer scientist, but I look at A's, T's, C's, and G's as being quaternary code, not binary code. Four states instead of two. So we've made one more investment in a company called GeneWeave Biosciences. GeneWeave has actually taken a bacteriophage and engineered it so that instead of reproducing when it finds its target, it glows. It makes luciferase. It so happens they found a bacteriophage that only affects Staph aureus. It only finds, but it finds it very well, Staph aureus. And if it finds MRSA, it glows. So we can make a very, very cheap test to tell whether a patient is colonized with MRSA before they even get into the hospital. Synthetic biology is in effect code, and this is a, basically one of the first companies in synthetic biology that I think is gonna have a big effect. So basically, I'm going to do the stop code on now and stop working, but Pablo Picasso said computers are useless, they only give you answers. Frankly, I think it's the opposite. I think we're going to need computers to do healthcare right in the future. Intelligent assistance, artificial intelligence that looks at an x-ray or a mammogram or, a, or an MRI scan and figures out what's wrong with this patient and kind of highlights it so the doctor can see it and look at it. Certainly, they're not going to be computers taking over medicine. We're going to still need touch. We're going to still need empathy. But they're going to become our partners in figuring out what's going on in medicine. That's why I believe healthcare is becoming digital. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody wants to come to the microscope. microphone. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I hope... I hope the doctor's named Theo, and I hope that's an iPad 12. My son works at Apple. So <laughs> anyway, yes, ma'am. Hi. My name is Andrea Downing, and I am a bractivist. I uh, blog at a website called Brave Bosom. Mm -hmm. I'm here, and I'm actually speaking this afternoon about the anatomy of a decision that I had to make. Mm -hmm. And um, my question for you is, I see this coming tsunami of gene sequencing technology. What I see on the other side of that as a patient is support needs to scale fast. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that 
um, the data in itself or all of these shiny new um, technologies are going to get us anywhere unless we actually solve problems that are practical within my community. So what are your thoughts on helping patients to make informed decisions so that they actually reduce their risk of cancer and realize that that's a lifelong path instead of just one test? Yeah. Most of my companies right now, a large segment of their staff are genetic counselors because they know, we, we know that most people didn't take, that most people didn't even know there was a genome when they went to high school. When I went to high school, there, we knew there was DNA and it was in a spiral shape and that was about it. Uh, so we know that this is one of the hardest problems is helping patients understand what the meaning is of this very complex data that they have just suddenly had produced. And understanding that the treatment may be different for them than it is for someone else because of their genetic makeup. Uh, that's, that's one of the challenging problems is the communication of all of this. And as the problem becomes more complex, as we understand the molecular basis of all disease, it's hard for any human being, even me occupying my own body, to understand what's wrong with this part of my body that's suddenly going haywire. So I think this is one of the biggest challenges we face right now is the communication of it. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't know. I see somebody running here. Uh... Hi, Ted. Thank you for a great talk. My name is Karthik. I'm co-founder of a startup on patient health data. Mm -hmm. What you shared is music to my ears. I love it. I hope it happens. My question to you is not if it's going to happen, but at what rate and in which sector. Um, where can we see, I can extrapolate from your investment thesis, areas mm -hmm. you believe in, but I'd love to hear from you. Where do you think we will have practical impact in the next five to 10 years? Well, I think that right now, since I'm investing principally in genomics companies of one sort or another, I'm looking at the diseases that are most genomically uh, regulated, modified, and, and enabled in some way or another. And that's why we chose prenatal diagnostics to begin with, was our first investment, in fact, was Natera. Uh, in this space was because I could see that was one of the greatest worries that a pregnant woman and, and her husband had was, is this child normal? And as we're having later and later uh, pregnancies in life, the, genetic, the risks of certain genetic abnormalities go up. I will say as well, there's a personal component to this as well. Um, as I was talking about myself as a child, I had a younger sister who was born and it turned out she was missing part of her 19th chromosome, but they did not discover that until she was nine years old. And so as a consequence, and it could easily now be discovered, Natera would have picked it up when they were nine weeks pregnant. My parents were nine weeks pregnant, but, but at that time they did not know until the child was nine weeks old. She has subsequently passed away from a variety of different genetic illnesses. So, I'm focused very much on places right now where genomics is having a practical, immediate effect on doctors' decision-making and the treatments that are being chosen. Someday, we may end up with companies that are focusing more on the predisposition. I'm slightly more likely to have this illness or that illness or something. But right now, I'm trying to focus very specifically on doctors' decisions. Another question? Uh, my name is Brett Alder. I'm a co-founder of a small internet company. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, you know, watching things with 23andMe and, mm -hmm. and the FDA, uh, moving forward with bioinformatics and, and getting that information to patients, is that, is that a concern for you, this growing amount of information and then the ability to kind of transmit that in safe ways to, to patients? Yeah, FDA has a real challenge because in this big data world that we live in right now, the FDA is suddenly faced with uh, what should we know and what shouldn't we know. I was one of 23andMe's first customers. I had my whole family done. I learned very important medical things that I did not know uh, in the process of that. So I have to confess, I tend to side on the side of 23andMe and think the FDA is preventing me from seeing my own genome. On the other hand, it's very true, as the earlier questioner said, that, that a lot of people don't understand what it means necessarily and need help in understanding that. Um, this is one of the challenges. Every advancement, every change that we undergo as a civilization has its pros and its cons. 
And we're going to have to balance these things. I mean, drones flying around looking in my bathroom window is an unexpected development that I didn't think <laughs> was going to happen. So every change has that kind of thing going on. They're telling me my time is out, so I'll take one more question real fast. Is it on? Yeah. I'm Javed Alu. I'm a physician. Now, my, I'm very excited about the opportunities that can arise out of this and hopefully mm -hmm. better care for some of these genetic mm -hmm. diseases. Um, but you, thank you for sharing the personal story for about your family as well. And mm -hmm. that's actually my concern and question around this. Um, is technology perhaps moving a bit fast where the ethics and the implications this has on the valuation of human life is changing? Um, so hopefully we have treatments one day, but in the beginning, it'll mm -hmm. come with earlier questions about, say, selective abortions and discussions around that mm -hmm. for patients and their families. Um, and is there a parallel discussion for all these companies looking to make products, hopefully to improve things, but also to consider what is the ethics of their decision making, not something to be ideology driven on, on actually producing this product to the market? Yeah. Well, for example, the prenatal diagnostics company right now only reports on fatal or, or potentially fatal genetic abnormalities. They do not report whether the child's going to have blonde hair or blue eyes, even though they do know. They do not report that sort of thing. And in fact, in some countries, it is illegal to report the sex of the child because there are, have been sex gender-based uh, abortion biases of one sort or another. So I think that there are an awful lot of ethical and challenging issues as we kind of open Pandora's box here and look at these issues. And I'm certainly not minimizing any of them. But I think that in the end, the information wants to be free. And we need to use this information as well as we can. I hope that helped. Thank you very much.